warrant officer four, retired Gerald Dean Brown, escorted by Hall of Fame member, the Honorable Del Daly. Captain retired Brian J. Crawford, representing his grandfather, the late CW4 retired William L. Roof, escorted by Hall of Fame member, Colonel retired Hal Kushner. <laughs> CW5 retired Paul L. Price, escorted by Hall of Fame member, General retired Brian Doug Brown. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the Hall of Fame Board of Trustees, Chief Warrant Officer 5, retired Randy W. Jones. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please rise for the presentation of the colors by the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment Airborne Honor Guard and remain standing for the national anthem sung by Ms. Candace Pipkin and remain standing for departure of the colors, a toast, and tonight's invocation. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rest we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the
Honored guests, fellow Hall of Fame inductees, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame 25th induction ceremony. Please charge your glasses and join me in a toast. Here's to our inductees, our armed forces everywhere, particularly those in harm's way and their families, past and present warriors who protect freedom worldwide. Hear, hear. <laughs> and now Chaplain Sonny Moore will join us and deliver the invocation. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. Thanks. Let's bow together and pray. Oh God, our help in ages past, I hope in years to come, be thou our guide while life shall last and our eternal home. Our Father, we thank you tonight for this special gathering to honor, to celebrate, and to salute three great Americans. God, we know that you made each of us. You had a plan and purpose for our lives and a destiny. And we're grateful that we've been challenged and inspired by the lives of these three men. And God, about each one of them, we'd say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for the Army Aviation Hall of Fame leadership, for family and friends gathered here tonight. God bless our food and fellowship and this program. It's a very special time and we give you thanks. Lord, we love you. Hear our prayers. Uh, forgive our sins. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sonny. Please be seated and enjoy your dinner. And watch the screens. We'll be displaying the fine sponsors that help make this night possible. Our program will resume in about one hour. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the Army Aviation Hall of Fame, Chief Warrant Officer 5, Randy Jones. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I certainly hope that you've enjoyed your meal this evening and you're in for a real treat with our induction ceremony. I came personally fortified with a great war story I wanted to tell you, but I was quickly reminded that nothing ruins a perfectly good war story like an eyewitness, so I'll defray that. <laughs> Tonight, we're gonna to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame is a real hall located at Fort Rucker, Alabama, where portraits and the citations of our inductees document their very valuable contributions to Army aviation. Tonight, three individuals will be added who have made an indelible impact on our branch and indeed upon the organic Army itself since its inception 76 years ago on June 6, 1942. Counting our new inductees, there are only 169 people currently in the Aviation Hall of Fame. These people represent a broad spectrum of communities, 105 officers, 31 warrant officers, 21 enlisted soldiers, nine aviation industry individuals, and three government employees. 19 of our members are recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Army Aviation Association of America, Brigadier General Retired Stephen D. Munt, please be recognized. Please stand. There he goes. Next, will the members of the trustees of the Hall of Fame please stand and be recognized? <clears throat> Joining them, Trustees, please remain standing. Uh, all the members in attendance that are current members of the Aviation Hall of Fame, please stand. Thank you. Before we begin this evening's inductions, please welcome again the Commanding General of the United States Army Aviation Center of Excellence, Major General. William K. Gaylor and his lovely wife, Michelle.
Thank you, sir. If you would, please join me on the stage here to assist with the induction of our new members. And now it is my privilege to begin the Army Aviation Hall of Fame induction ceremony, 25th cycle. Our master of ceremonies this evening is a very loved member of the media and a prior service individual, and he'll be with us and has received numerous works for his awards in television and documentaries. He has produced, written, and hosted scores of documentaries programs on the history of our military, aviation, and our country's efforts in space. As a panel moderator, he joined astronauts Neil Armstrong, Jim Lovell, and Gene Cernan on the three morale-boosting trips to visit our troops in Iraq, Afghanistan, and on aircraft carriers in the Northern Arabian Sea. He served three years of his life on active duty as an officer in the United States Air Force Strategic Air Command, and at last year's Quad A, ceremonies, he was recognized as a Knight of the Honorable Order of St. Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to Mr. David Hartman. Thank you. Thank you all. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, it seems like often uh, we might be wise to consider replacing the personal pronoun I with the first person plural we. Um, not I did this and that, but we did this, we accomplished that, which defines team. Uh, in his acceptance remarks this morning, Dr. Lewis started off by referring to that word team several times and the importance of team, obviously, in Army aviation. Well, to create our great country, our great democracy, the first document was actually written by just one man, a very smart guy from Virginia, Thomas Jefferson, and two other smart men, Ben Franklin and John Adams, suggested just a couple of words be changed. Uh, Jefferson agreed, but the Declaration of Independence was Jefferson's. That was his. And for our country, that declaration was, quote, the promise. Next, George Washington's military team took over, and against all odds, as we know, whipped the British. Goodbye, King George III. Goodbye, Parliament. You're out of here. And so now it's the early 1780s. We were 13 independent states, independent and very ununited. So how do you unite the ununited states? Well, the best and the brightest from the southern states, the middle states, the New England states got together in a room in Philadelphia in May of 1787. They disagreed about a lot of big issues, economic issues, political, cultural, huge disagreements. Well, what they did was to sit down together and talk and listen to each other. They shared thoughts. Legislators talking, listening, sharing thoughts. And they compromised. General Munt, there's that word. We talked about it last night. Compromise. Now that was, in fact is, a really interesting idea. Well, that team drafting the Constitution put country ahead of their own regional goals, and they wrote the greatest document of governments ever written, then or now. It wasn't perfect, but for over 300 years, we've been making it better. If the Declaration was the promise, the Constitution was the fulfillment. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Helen Keller. 
Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. No one understands team better than all of you in Army Aviation. And I am so grateful to join you this evening in honoring three great patriots who represent all of you, the Army Aviation team, as you protect the freedoms of our great country. Thank you. Our first inductee tonight, Chief Warrant Officer for retired Gerald Dean Brown, from fixing them to flying them. CW4 Dean Brown has done it all. He set the bar higher and higher along the way. And with so many Army aviation firsts to his name, it is so appropriate that tonight we all honor the Army aviator this evening. Please direct your attention to the screen. Gerald Dean Brown was born in the small town of O'Fallon, Illinois in 1965. He enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1982, rose to the rank of sergeant, and became a special operations aviation cargo helicopter repairman and crew member. His assignments included positions as a maintenance team leader, flight engineer on the CH-47C and MH-47C and D aircraft, and squad leader. In 1989, Brown was one of the first enlisted crew members sent to flight school to become a special operations aviator. He became a warrant officer, and after completing flight school, rejoined the famed Night Stalkers of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment Airborne. He rapidly rose to flight leader, eventually attaining the rank of CW4, and was the battalion standardization officer at Fort Campbell. The day after the terrorist attack on 9-11, then CW3 Dean Brown became the lead planner for America's first armed response operation. The JSOC commander, Dean, and others personally briefed President George W. Bush and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld via video teleconference. On October 19, 2001, CW3 Brown himself led a round-trip flight of 20 aircraft taking off from the aircraft carrier USS Kitty Hawk in the Persian Gulf toward Afghanistan. The operation eliminated numerous Taliban and Al-Qaeda personnel and seized valuable intelligence. This was the longest helicopter assault in U.S. military history. Soon after, the U.S. received intelligence that eight missionaries and aid workers, including two Americans, had escaped the Taliban and were on the run in the city of Ghazni. In response, Chief Brown planned and rehearsed a rescue mission briefed as extreme high risk. On 14 November 2001, again from the USS Kitty Hawk, Brown led three Chinooks 850 miles toward their objective seven and a half hours away. Over Afghanistan, at night, the Chinooks flew amid some of the harshest terrain in the world in mountains with zero illumination and high winds and bringing their aircraft to their absolute limits of performance and power. After flying at 500 feet from ridge to ridge, they reached the objective through enemy fire but saw only the darkened city below and no signs of the detainees. With only 30 minutes of fuel left before they had to abort, the Americans spotted a small fire streaking through the streets. Hoping this was a signal from the detainees, the Chinooks followed the fire to an open field. Special Operations Forces rushed out and rescued the detainees. Once again, all the helicopters landed safely back on the Kitty Hawk, having completed the longest rescue mission in U.S. military history of over 1,700 miles round trip. From 2001 to 2005, Brown conducted 13 rotations in Operation Enduring Freedom and led more than 125 combat missions. CW4 Dean Brown retired from active duty in 2005 
as an MH-47G aviator with over 10,000 flight hours. But that was not the end of Dean Brown's career supporting special operations. He then became a civilian flight instructor and continues training the best of the best to this very day. CW4 Dean Brown is the model of a special operations aviation professional. Please welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame, CW4 retired Gerald Dean Brown. And he is accompanied by the ambassador retired Deli Daly. Distinguished guests, family, friends, Night Stalkers, and Quad A members, I am deeply humbled and honored to be here tonight to be inducted in the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. Thanks to all who made tonight possible with their hard work, especially Janice and Raina. I would not be here tonight if it was not for the outstanding service of my fellow Night Stalkers, past and present. Colonel Bruce Bridges once told me that he appeared brilliant because he surrounded himself with brilliant people. I have done just that. I have been led by brilliant leaders, General Luck, Ambassador Daly, General Magnum, General Brown, General Peterson, General Colt, General Huttmacher, General Jones, among others. I have planned missions with brilliant flight leads. Doug England, Dave Fallon, Randy Olson, John Naylor, Frank Mancuso, among other great flight leads. I've been supported by the best and brilliant NCOs the Army has to offer. Too many names to even begin to mention. I share this honor with all of them and the brilliant work they have done and many of them continue to do today. I've been extremely blessed to have a supportive family standing behind me. My wife, Joanna, my son, Austin, and my daughter, Autumn. I thank my great friend, CW3 Scott Schrader, who gave me peace of mind looking out for Joanna and the kids while I was away focusing on supporting Special Operation Forces. To my family and in-laws from Illinois and Arizona, my friends from Clarksville, and those who have traveled from across the country, it means the world to me that you are here tonight. Thank you for coming tonight to share this moment with me. Time on target, plus or minus 30 seconds. Legends never die. Tip of the spear, beware the dark horse. Night Stalkers don't quit. Thank you. And here to help him uh, celebrate, his wife Joanna, uh, son Austin, his girlfriend uh, Allie Alfeld, or Alfeld, uh, daughter Autumn Brown, and her boyfriend Griff Wood, mother Jacqueline, sister Tracy Moreland, brother Paul Brown, father-in-law Jerry Sinsky, and brother-in-law Mike Harris, and his wife Madonna. Would you all please stand and be recognized? Our next inductee this evening, the late Chief Warrant Officer Four, retired William L. Roof, a member of the greatest generation. CW4 Willie Roof served this great nation of ours for 52 years in and out of uniform, from World War II to Korea to Vietnam and beyond. His impacts on Army and Army aviation are unequivocally worthy of his induction into the Hall of Fame this evening. Please, again, your attention to the screens.
William L. Roof, known as Willie, was born on February 16, 1923, at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. He enlisted in the Army on June 4, 1941, and was stationed in Hawaii when Pearl Harbor was attacked. For the next 34 months, he saw combat in the Pacific. At one point, he was captured by the enemy, but escaped. By the end of the war, at age 22, Willie had risen to the rank of Regimental Sergeant Major. He went on to hold leadership positions in the 3rd, 5th, and 7th Infantry Divisions and the 11th Airborne. In 1949, Master Sergeant Roof became a warrant officer and an instructor in infantry light weapons. In 1953, as a chief warrant officer, he was assigned to the first Army Cargo Helicopter Pilots course, graduating in 1955. The next year, he was assigned to the newly established Presidential Helicopter Flight Detachment in Washington, D.C. Woolley flew Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon, as well as numerous other heads of state. In 1962, Willie volunteered for service in Vietnam, where he flew Generals Creighton Abrams and William Westmoreland. Returning to the States, Willie was assigned to the famed 11th Air Assault Division at Fort Benning, Georgia. In 1965, he was promoted to CW-4 and later assigned to Fort Rucker as a standardization instructor pilot until his retirement on January 1st, 1970. He continued as an Army Civil Service instructor pilot until his final retirement in 1993, after 52 years of federal service. For the rest of his life, Willie remained active in the Aviation Center community. He worked to create the Aviation Museum at Fort Rucker and then served as its primary tour guide. He drove disabled Vietnam veterans to and from the VA hospital in Montgomery. As an emeritus instructor, he spoke to every new warrant officer attending the initial entry rotary wing course between 1998 and 2005. He connected with young soldiers, unselfishly sharing his knowledge, his experience, and passion for Army aviation. In 2006, he had the honor of pinning his own wings on his grandson, Brian Crawford, who went into Army aviation because of Willie. In 2013, Willie's contributions were recognized when Fifth Avenue at Fort Rucker was renamed Roof Avenue. And again, when the Willie Roof Leadership Award was established to recognize the warrant officer candidate in each class who exhibits the leadership and character and competence that Willie embodied. Having fought in the infantry in World War II and flown in combat in Korea, Vietnam, Lebanon, and the Dominican Republic, Willie's awards include the Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross, the Legion of Merit, two Bronze Stars, two Purple Hearts, and the Combat Infantryman's Badge. A member of the greatest generation, he gave selflessly of himself throughout his life. Although he passed away on September 20th, 2007, at the age of 84, he lives on in the hearts of many and now in the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. CW4 retired, William L. Roof. And Willie's grandson, Willie's grandson, Captain Retired Brian Crawford, uh, is escorted by Colonel Retired Hal Kushner.
Good evening, everyone, distinguished guests. I'm extremely honored to be here tonight to accept this award on behalf of my grandfather, Willie Roof, his wife, Kim, my mother, Terry Crawford, my father, Trace Crawford, my uncle, Billy, and my sisters, Kimberly and Jennifer. I would also like to thank the many people who worked so hard to take the time to put this nomination together in order to honor him. Also, I'd like to thank Quad A, and in particular, Ms. Janice Arena for coordinating this event and for working closely with my family to make this possible. My grandfather would have been honored and humbled by this award, though in his eyes he did nothing special or unexpected. He just served the nation that he loved. He did what he loved and he loved what he did. As you heard in the video, he joined the Army when he was young and grew into a hardworking, proud, and brave soldier. He started his career as an 18-year-old recruit, and by 22, he was a regiment of sergeant major. It's pretty amazing to me. He retired as a Chief Warrant Officer four. He spent over 50 years of his life dedicated to serving the United States Army. He flew over 16,000 flight hours, 1,200 of which were in combat, in multiple aircraft. And some of those aircraft are parked in the museum at Fort Rucker today. Growing up, my grandfather was larger than life. He was a true war hero. He was part of the greatest generation that's ever lived. He loved being a soldier and he loved being an aviator. We heard so many stories about his career and so many of his unique experiences helped shape our lives and lives of all those who he interacted with. But at the same time, he was just my pop-up. He was a great man who loved his family and who loved his friends and would do anything for them. What kid would not want to join the Army and become a pilot just like his grandfather? Flight school was not easy, but I had the unique privilege of having an Army aviation legend living right next door to me to offer mentorship and advice, even if that encouraging advice was telling me at least your helicopter has gauges and at least you have manuals to study from. <laughs> he would continually remind me that the Army used to be hard and that aviation used to be hard. <laughs> I was very proud that when I graduated from flight school, that my grandfather got to pin his own wings on me. Willie never met a stranger anywhere that he went. He had friends and extended family all over the world. We used to joke that he could talk to a wall if it showed a little bit of interest. <laughs> and if you let him take the opportunity to talk about aviation, helicopters, or the Army, you might as well cross off the rest of your day, because he's going to take it. A couple short stories. He took my grandmother and my two sisters and I around the, the country in, a, in an RV for 30 days, coast to coast. And along the way, there was an accident. I think we were in Wyoming or something like that. Uh, the traffic was so bad that we pulled off into a rest area. And right as we pull off, these two medevac helicopters land. And he gets all excited. And he grabs us, my, my sisters and I, and takes us over to these helicopters. He's like, let's go check these out. This is going to be great. Well, wouldn't you know, as soon as we get there, one of these pilots comes out, and he kind of squints, and he looks over, and he says, Willie? Is that you? And my grandfather's like, wow, what a small world. Well, this pilot says, it's about to get smaller, Willie, and he calls over to the pilot of the second helicopter and says, hey, check out who this is. Another time, my mom and my dad were in Hawaii, and they were getting ready to take one of those tours around the island. My mom was really not that excited to get into this Hughes 500 small little bubble helicopter. She really wasn't into flying at all, actually. But the pilot, who was a former Army aviator, he saw that my mom was a little uneasy about what she was getting ready to go into. and she, He tried to reassure her. He tried to say, don't worry about it. When I was in flight school, I had this mean SOB as an instructor pilot. His name was Willie Roof. And I passed flight school, and I flew in Vietnam, so surely I can fly around here. And I'm not sure who was more shocked that day to, to see the connection back to Willie Roof. The stories could, about my grandfather could go on and on, and I'm sure there are many of you in this room tonight that have your own special stories and, and, and can think of these memories where he just has a special place in your hearts. He not only made a significant impact in the lives of my family, but arguably on generations of members of the aviation branch as a whole. Some soldiers try to get out of the shadow 
of their distinguished family members while they're in the service. I was always proud and humbled to be known as Willie Roof's grandson. Even at those times where the sentiments generally were expressed as, what in the world were you thinking, Lieutenant Crawford? Your grandfather could have done that maneuver in his sleep. <laughs> Simply put, some kids have played with GI Joes when they were kids. I had a real life GI Joe, a true American hero. My grandfather, my mentor, my friend. I know he's looking down on us tonight smiling. This is truly a wonderful honor for him and for our family. So thank you again from the bottom of our hearts for capturing his legacy at this wonderful event and continuing to allow his legacy to live on through the Army Aviation Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. And to join Mr. Roof's uh, family in celebrating his widow, Kim, his daughter, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Terry Crawford, and her husband, Colonel Retired Raymond, grandson, Captain Retired Brian Crawford, and granddaughter, Jennifer and Kimberly, would you all please stand and be recognized? Our final inductee of the evening, Chief Warrant Officer 5, retired Paul L. Price, uh, considered the Army Aviation Technical Experts expert. CW5 Paul Price, a plank holder of the 160th Special Ops Aviation Regiment Airborne. He has developed, tested, and refined each of the mission packages for that pioneering Army Aviation unit. He qualified in 30 different aircraft with over 11,000 hours of flight time. He is a legend in the special ops community. Please direct your attention back to the screen. Paul L. Price was born into a Marine Corps aviation family in Pensacola, Florida in 1955. He enlisted in the U.S. Army in 1974 rose to the rank of Sergeant E-5, and served with the B-158th AHB of the 101st Airborne, the UH-1 crew chief, section leader, and platoon sergeant. In March 1978, Paul was accepted in the Army's flight training program at Fort Rucker and graduated in the top 10% of his class. He returned to the same flight company of the 101st, and within two months, was designated a UH-1 pilot in command. In 1979, following Desert One, the failed attempt to rescue U.S. hostages in Iran, Paul was part of intensive planning and training for a new rescue mission. When the hostages were released, Paul joined the newly formed Task Force 160 and started his service as a special operations aviator. In October 1983, the 160th was ordered to help rescue Americans held by Cubans on the island of Grenada. During the rescue, Paul's Black Hawk was hit by enemy fire, which killed his co-pilot, Captain Keith Lucas. In spite of shrapnel wounds to his face and severe damage to his aircraft, Paul managed to fly away from the gunfire with the body of his co-pilot and executed a controlled crash landing. For his actions, Paul was awarded the Purple Heart and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Starting in 1985 and for the next 18 years, Paul served in a special missions unit. He developed, tested, and refined rotor and fixed wing mission equipment packages, many of which are still in use today by Army and Air Force Aviation. In 1997, Paul deployed to Bosnia-Herzegovina. He led countless missions to track and capture persons indicted for war crimes. One particular mission was flown at night through brutal conditions of ice and snow, but the force was inserted on time and on target 
which allowed the capture and export of a war criminal to the World Court in The Hague. After 9-11, remaining in a special missions unit, Paul was part of advanced force operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, where he executed multiple long-range insertions, direct action, reconnaissance, and target snatches. In 2003, Paul retired from the U.S. Army as the Chief Warrant Officer 5. As a civilian, he joined the U.S. Army's night vision labs at Fort Belvoir and deployed to Iraq for over a year, flying combat missions in support of ground tactical units and providing IED detection and overwatch. Today, as the Aviation Branch Chief for Air Systems Division Night Vision and Electronic Sensors Directorate, Paul ensures that aviation warfighters are armed with state-of-the-art pilotage and intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance sensor systems. Paul has logged more than 11,100 hours, including 800 hours of combat and imminent danger in some 30 different aircraft. In the air and on the ground, no warrant officer has done more to serve Army aviation today operationally, tactically, and technically than Paul Price. He is a pioneer and epitomizes the quiet professionalism of the Warrant Officer Corps. Please welcome to the Army Aviation Hall of Fame, CW5 retired, Paul L. Price. And joining Paul, his Hall of Fame escort, General Retired, Doug Brown. Quad A, General Brown, General Cody, Honorable Daly, Paula, Teresa, Ann, all my Army aviators, former unit members, and other distinguished guests. Never did I think back in 1978 and when I entered flight school that I would be on this stage, sharing this stage with two legends to my left. Amazing. What an honor. When I think back on this outstanding journey, my greatest achievements have been working side by side with the best aviators and commanders that you could offer. Far uh, from what behind the ears as a W-1 flying with the Vietnam veterans uh, in the 101, to the end of my career, I never wanted to leave this great organization. A face overly used but so appropriate, you are my band of brothers and yes, my sisters. The roads have been happy and sad, but in the end, we are the greatest fighting force this world has ever seen. I am proud of this heritage, and I thank Army, and I thank Army Aviation for letting me be part of it. The second tier of this great legacy is my family. Where will we be without them? I laid my father to rest at Arlington this past January. Yes, he was an aviator. He just chose the wrong service as a Marine Corps fi fighter pilot. <laughs> and he and I would often debate the pros and cons. I do believe I always came out the victor. I'm sure he would have a different outlook if he was here today. Mothers, we all have them. Jane, please stand up. If you could pick who you wanted for a mother, you don't have to look any farther. Thank you, Mom, for all your support throughout this wonderful journey. I love you. Brothers and sisters, oh man. Dale, Earl, and Deborah. Dale, my older brother, uh, was my teacher, my hunter. He taught me patience. I remember the days out 
in the woods, waiting for those deer to come by. I had my 410. There was a covey of quail on the ground. I aimed my rifle, and he looked at me. He says, you pull that trigger, you're going out the tree. I said, yes, sir, got it. Deborah taught me to relax. Don't stress the small stuff. And Earl, Earl taught me how to enjoy life. But he still can't figure out if he's a W3 or a captain. You'll have to get the details from him. Children, of course, I have the best. Stephanie, Corey, and Kyle. From my long deployments, missed birthdays, and holidays, it's always a joy to come home, reunite, catch up, and always be the good parent. And you all know what I mean. <laughs> Both my sons have served in Army Aviation, and my youngest son, is, Kyle, is still serving. He's a captain with the 10th Mountain Flying Blackhawks and not loving life right now because he's the assistant S3. <laughs> to my wife, Jean, my rock, the person who has the sense to keep me calm and focused on what is important in life. I love you, babe. Post-Army, I had the opportunity to go back and work for the Army Night Vision Labs, Fort Belvoir, as a DAC aviator. Just to let you know, the government personnel I work with are dedicated to bring you the best equipment you need. They listen, they deploy to theater just like you do, and bring to life your thoughts of improve, improvement and future uh, equipment. In closing, this is the 100th anniversary of the Warrant Officer Corps. How appropriate for three Warrant Officers to have been selected into the Army Aviation Hall of Fame in 2018. Thank you for letting me be part of your legacy. Soldier on. And to celebrate with Mr. Price, please welcome again his wife, Jean, son, Paul, son, Captain Kyle and Aubriana Price, daughter, Stephanie Hamrick, granddaughter, Sydney and Emily Price, brother, Captain Earl and Karen Price, sister-in-law, Nan Larson, brother-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel Harry Patterson, retired, and his wife, Caroline, brother-in-law, Richard Patterson, and his uncle, um, Colonel, U.S. Air Force retired, Donald Hinkle, his wife Patricia, and their daughter Lynn. Would you all, oh, you're already standing. All right. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that ends my part of the ceremony. I, again, am honored to be with you to share this wonderful evening honoring these great patriots. Thank you all very much. Thank you again, David, for the impact you've had on our organization. I truly believe you're for the reason for making this a premier event at this summit. And I look for it to grow in the future. We've made tremendous gains this year, every year exponentially increasing our attendance. And look forward to recognizing all of these soldiers, in particular the Hall of Fame inductees, and may you come again each and every year to do so. To, work, to a point where we can rival the Country Music Awards. <laughs> also, I'd like you, if you would imagine, there are many, many people that we owe thanks to for helping the Army. Aviation Hall of Fame salute all these class of 2018 inductees. Thanks to John Fishback, for his, uh, our video producer for all his coordination support, and the whole Quad A team, especially Janice, who take such great care of our awardees and the Hall of Fame inductees. Thank you all. I thank you all for your attendance this evening and for your continued outstanding support of Army Aviation Hall of Fame. On behalf of its members, you have our deep gratitude for your support and recognition. Please mark your calendars 
The 26th Army Aviation Hall of Fame ceremony will be again in Nashville next year on Monday night, April 16, 2019. I would ask that all this evening's inductees and their families and escorts remain in the immediate vicinity here so we can take some more photos with their photos. And meanwhile, let's give our Hall of Fame class of 2018 one more final round of applause. Thank you and good evening. <laughs>